Mr. Son. Uh, thank you all for um, coming. Welcome to the um, Centre for Social Justice Fringe event. You're all very welcome here. Uh, my name is Gavin Rice. I'm the head of the Work and Welfare Unit at the CSJ. Uh, as you can probably hear, I've got a little bit of what is known as a conference voice, which, uh, unlike COVID-19, is an ancient and familiar illness for those of us that are veterans uh, of, uh, of conference. Uh, and uh, you're not here to hear from me, so I'll keep my introductory remarks quite brief. Uh, I'm very pleased to be joined today by um, Alex Burkhart, MP, the new uh, Minister for Apprenticeships and Skills on my left, also formerly of this parish, so he was formerly the Director of Policy uh, at the CSJ. Uh, I have Eleanor Harrison uh, from uh, Impetus um, here, uh, CEO of Impetus, uh, who's had an extensive career in non-profit sector uh, all around the world, uh, funds and builds um, uh, promising charities, and uh, we can hear more about her organisation um, in uh, a moment's time. On my, um, uh, on my far right, I have Joe uh, Watford, who's the head of policy at Football Beyond Borders. Um, to the left of Alex, I have Chris Oglesby, who's the chief executive of Brontwood and also does fantastic work through the Oglesby Charitable Trust, uh, is a very renowned and respected um, philanthropist, uh, longtime uh, friend and ally and companion of the CSJ, and also does fantastic work um, supporting the CSJ's regional presence, including in our, uh, our Northwest um, office. Uh, and on my far left, um, I have um, Alice Stott, who is the Director of um, Schools at Voice 21, which is a charity dedicated to raising the status of speaking in schools. So a very interesting um, panel um, that we have here today. So um, the UK is in something of a skills crisis. Um, Nine million working age adults lack basic numeracy and literacy skills, which is quite a shocking um, figure. This is a tremendous waste of potential. Um, we at the Centre for Social Justice believe very strong, strongly, very firmly, that work is one of the key pathways out of poverty. But of course, it's very difficult not only to get into work, but also to progress in work and to improve one's outcome, to improve one's earnings, to improve one's skills. If one lacks um, the basic skill set that will um, allow you um, to do so, the national conversation can very often become uh, intensely focused simply upon the generosity um, of welfare and the level that benefits should be. And a very important discussion that that is, and it's one which the CSJ has intervened positively and proactively in. Um, we also need to talk very seriously about work uh, and employment, um, particularly for those who um, are very sadly um, perhaps not, as, uh, n n not the most match fit in the current context. Of course, COVID-19 has um, not helped in this regard. It has in many ways enhanced, intensified, and exacerbated pre-existing um, inequalities, um, inequalities of opportunity in our society. Um, and uh, uh, that's one of the major reasons that this government um, has uh, committed to, um, to, to, to the levelling up um, agenda. Um, children being out of schools um, has put many children's education back by a matter of months. And those which were struggling the most are those who have been left behind the most. And uh, there's speculation that it may take um, many years, five, ten years, perhaps even a generation, to fully rectify the inequalities that have arisen as a result of those increased educational disparities um, as a result of the lockdown. There's also wider um, skills challenges in our economy. So at the moment we have, as we know, um, a labour shortage. Um, we've had the end of the furlough scheme last week with a million people coming off of that scheme. Um, potentially more than half of them, possibly even as many as 700,000, may find that they don't have jobs to go back to. Uh, the good news is that there are jobs that are available, but of course the challenge is that the vacancies are not necessarily correlated with the skill set of the people who are searching for work. Um, and uh, um, therefore we have serious questions to answer about how we upskill and reskill um, our workers and our labour force to make sure that uh, we have the labour um, uh, and, the, and the, the skilled workers and skilled employees that we need in a post-Brexit and post-COVID economy. Um, there's long-term challenges around STEM. Um, uh, according to the Confederation of British Industry, um, as many as 30% of STEM employers report that they're unable to recruit because they cannot find um, particularly entry-level and younger workers um, who have the skill set um, in order to, um, in order to uh, get on and to progress. Um, and to uh, thrive within the STEM sector. Uh, and uh, this is going to be a, a key priority, both in terms of education, but also in terms of work and skills um, for this government. Um, so um, we're going to have 
introductory remarks from each speaker, approximately five minutes, um, please, if possible. Um, and uh, then what will happen is we'll move into a more general discussion, going back and forth, uh, and then we will have um, some Q&A towards the end. Um, so with no further ado, could I please um, start by introducing um, Alex, the new uh, Minister for Apprenticeships and Skills. Uh, well, look, uh, good morning, everyone. And it's a real pleasure to be back because, uh, as Gavin said, for five years I was Director of Policy at the Centre for Social Justice between 2012 and 2016, when I think some of the people now working there had just been born. And um, uh, it, you know, it's a surefire way of feeling old to, to come back, but it's great to be back, Andy. And you know, it's wonderful to see how you've managed to make the, uh, the think tank uh, flower and go on to great things um, you know, since you got rid of me. Um, uh, I, um, uh, but yeah, the, the values that I, uh, you know, uh, we, we used to discuss at the CSJ, and I know you still uh, discuss and drive, uh, are still the ones that frame how uh, I see things. Uh, and the, the pathways to poverty, five pathways to poverty, have uh, framed a lot of my thinking over the years. You know, the fact that it's family breakdown and worklessness and addiction and serious problem debt and educational failure that leads so many people to get caught in a rut that they struggle to get out of without, without a lot of help. And I think perhaps the only way that I've, I've started to sort of see that through a different prism uh, is in government, you start to think more about what are the pathways to prosperity. And they're the, exactly the same things, but just turned on their head. And for what, me, where I am right now, it's skills. It's undoing educational failure, either when young people are in schools or helping people who've already left school uh, overcome the, the fact that they didn't get the qualifications they wanted when they were there. And I'm going to go on and talk about that in a minute, but I can't uh, really talk uh, in this session without discussing a little bit uh, about, well, it's sort of trampling on Will Quince's territory a bit, because um, you know, Will is the current Minister for, for Children and Families, He's an excellent minister, really done, did a really, really good job at DWP, very delighted to have him as colleague in, in DfE. Um, but you know, where I've, a, a lot of the things that I've, I've seen over the past 10 years uh, have shown me time and time again that the problems that we see early on in a child's educational journey are really problems at home. Uh, when I was in the number 10 policy unit uh, in 2016, a uh, piece of work I commissioned was to look at the life journeys of all of those young people who at the age of 19 were neat for a year, were not in employment, education or training for a year. And over half of those young people, it turned out, had either been children in care at some point when they were under 18, or they had been children in need. That's an official category meaning children right on the edge of care. Over half of all the young people in our society who became long-term need at 19 had had an official intervention from the state because of family breakdown, because of dysfunctional families. This is the real root and core of so many of the problems that we face, and it's the CSJ that continues to tell that story and tell it powerfully. Now, I, I won't go into what needs to be done because that's Will's, uh, Will's brief, and I, I don't, you know, my, my job here is to, uh, to tell you what we're doing and to not make news. Um, but, the, um, the, uh, but what I can say is, is what we're looking at later in the process. I'm, I'm 16 plus. You know, I'm, I'm everything that uh, people learn at FE, everything they learn after they leave college everything they go back to learn um, uh, when they're adults. Because this, and this is the, for the young people who are 16 to 19, this is about uh, getting them the vocational technical skills that are going to build great careers for them. Yeah. An alternative route, an equal route, it should be to, uh, to going to university, um, but also for the people who are a little bit uh, later on, who need a second chance, yeah, who, need, uh, who want another turn of the wheel. Who uh, who don't uh, don't like the route they're on uh, and want uh, want to upgrade their skills, and uh, this is one of the things I've, I've really found absolutely fascinating since I, I took on the brief a whole three weeks ago. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yesterday I went I went to Salford. I went to Media City in Salford, and I saw one of the, the DfE boot camps, digital boot camp that's going on in the Media City, and it's training people up over sixteen weeks, an intensive course in cyber security creating the skills that the businesses in Media City need 
in order to grow their businesses further. And you know, the, these people, range of ages, range of life experiences, all on a track that they know will lead to a job interview in their city, in a business, in an industry that is driving the prosperity of their city. Really, really inspirational stuff. And um, you know, we, we are doing, we are currently expanding our program of boot camps um, a great deal for a whole range of areas in a whole range of uh, parts of the country. And um, you know, similarly, you know, we want people to be able, we people who didn't get A levels, people who don't have level three qualifications, as uh, as we call them in the department, but people don't call them outside of the sector. <laughs> you know, that, that people, you know, people who didn't get those A levels um, can go back and take uh, uh, take advantage of the prime minister's lifetime skills guarantee. You can go and get level three qualifications uh, in technical areas boost your career chances and that's yeah it's very very exciting um, prospect again chance for people to move on to progress again the sort of thing that the CSJ has always championed through its work on universal credit how do you get people into work how do you get them into more work how do you get them into better work and the skills agenda that uh, that Nadeem Zahawi is is leading right now is really driving that through you know through this different prism through this prism of lifelong uh, training and then further down the track, uh, we have uh, the Prime Minister's idea for uh, a lifelong learning uh, entitlement, uh, lifelong learning. So if you've got your level three and you want to get your technical skills at level four and level five, those skills that are holding, uh, lack of those skills are holding back productivity in our country, you'll be able to borrow the money on the same terms that an undergraduate can borrow those mo uh, that money to you know, get yourself the next job, to move on. Uh, and you know, that continuum, is really what is uh, you know, driving me as I look at what this job can do, for, what this uh, what this um, uh, brief can do. Yeah, at every stage, how do we help people skill up? How do we help them move on? How do we help them progress? How do we help them take control of their life story? And uh, yeah, the last thing I want to just you know, want to land with you is that it's uh, it's not just about uh, what we're asking the individual. It's about what we're asking business as well, what we're asking industries and sectors and cities around the country. We're trying to build a much more responsive system, a system in which uh, there is greater dialogue between local government, business, and uh, further education, adult uh, education providers, so that we can say hand on heart to potential students, these are the job opportunities in your area. These are the training courses that we know lead to jobs in this area you know this is how you can build a career in your part of the country this is how you can have ownership of prosperity in your part of the country this is an extremely exciting time for skills this is an extremely exciting time for our country and our economy and what we can do now is we can create a generation who has the opportunity and the ability and the know-how and the knowledge to turn on and log in and skill up and that's what we're going to be doing. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, really thought-provoking stuff. Um, I'm going to come now to Eleanor Harrison from Impetus, who uh, we are very pleased to say is supporting this event. It's fantastic to have her here with us. Um, Eleanor, could you perhaps start by just talking a little bit about your organisation and then uh, on to your, uh, your thoughts and remarks? Thanks, Gavin. Can everybody hear me okay? Brilliant. So thank you for those remarks, Alex, and thank you for agreeing to speak at this event with the CSJ. I know it's only three weeks into your new role. Um, and summary, Impetus's mission is to help young people to, from disadvantaged backgrounds succeed at school, at work and in life. Um, and it's really important for this agenda. We're all about hard outcomes. So that statistically improve the chances, life chances for young people. So that's educational attainment it's university access and it's sustained jobs. And we invest in promising cha charities with long-term capital and investment expertise, supporting them to establish what really works and then to scale. So Impetus helped found the Education Endowment Foundation over a decade ago with the Sutton Trust. We currently run the Youth Endowment Fund for the Home Office, establishing what works in reducing youth violence. Um, we were fortunate to co-found with fantastic 
kind of colleagues, the National Tutoring Programme last year and the Youth Employment Group um, at the heart of the first lockdown. So I'll definitely say I think we believe in partnership and we believe that good change is possible. Um, we're not negative. I'd be really remiss for me not to say that Football Beyond Borders and Voice 21, who are on the panel and you're going to hear from, uh, they're fantastic colleagues of Impetus. We've been backing them for several years because they both deliver benchmark beating outcomes. And if we're going to deliver on apprenticeships and skills, it's about kind of outcomes be beating work. So skills reform, um, it's rightly a major plank of the government's le levelling up agenda. So we're all eager in the sector to see how this commitment is translated into resources in the upcoming comprehensive spending review. And we're also eager to see what the government is going to do with the recommendations of the AUGA review it inherited. I think it would be fair to say that we've all been waiting quite a long time to have a response to AUGA. Now, we're realists at Impetus, so we're not expecting proposals and resources that can meet the needs of everyone. That would be an unfair ask. But we do want to see all, and I repeat, all young people, irrespective of their background, have the range of options open to them and be able to pick the right choice for them. So it will not surprise you when I ask the question, who should be the focus of our attention? We think that young people living in poverty should absolutely be the attention kind of, of the new skills agenda. It's critical to any vision of levelling up. You know, as you heard from Gavin's intro, you know, these young people are behind before they even start school. It's measurable at 22 months. They're 40% less likely to get English and Maths GCSE. They're less likely to go to university and they're less likely to get jobs. And they're 50% more likely to not be in education, employment or training. Um, now, we'll give a plug here for Level 2. So we heard Alex say Level 3. But investment in Level 2 is absolutely critical and solvable as part of this agenda. And otherwise, the risk is that that stubborn neat rate which is at about 11%, will increase and then levelling up will fail. Now, what do we already know? What is the evidence on which we should be basing our policies? So we heard a little about, about early years. Relationships, aspirations and expectations really matter in that area. English and maths GCSE by the age of 19 is the critical determinant on your income level later on in our society. The role of tutoring kind of is really critical in helping people that have been left behind. I talked about level two, also level one apprenticeships. Going to university does deliver high outcomes for young people from poor backgrounds. Widening participation has been a success. So a plug here, don't cut from higher education to fund further education, but do fund further education more. High quality, highly relational, six to 12 week employment programs with employer links embedded do succeed in helping young people get into work. And attention in all these phases is essential to bridge the skills gap. Now, just a little bit on widening participation. So improving the quality of non-university routes to intermediate and higher skills is long overdue and needed. But do not overlook ensuring that young people have a fair opportunity to access university if it's the right route for them. I'm really delighted that Alex's brief includes widening participation in HE alongside the non-HE elements he's talked about. Higher education and further education are not in competition. They are different valued routes for young people to thrive. They're part of the same ecosystem. Now, I hope a well-joined up brief for Alex is the first step to towards developing a coherent post-18 system. I'm not sure if I want to say no pressure to Alex or please don't miss this opportunity. Um, and then just a little bit more on technical skills and apprenticeships in bridging the gap. Um, many of you will be aware that the unintended consequence of the apprenticeship levy is we have the lowest levels of young people act accessing apprenticeships now than we have had in over a decade. It wasn't meant, it's an unintended consequence. And there's a real lack of focus on level two, and yet we know investing in level two helps young people from poor backgrounds transition into level three roles. So again, let's not miss the opportunity to really tackle the neat issue. So in summary, let's be strategic, let's follow the data, and let's implement and scale what works. Do invest in high quality social and emotional interventions that contribute to attainment, 
And that's key. We've got a lot of social and emotional interventions that need to contribute to attainment in early years, primary and secondary. Do invest in literacy and numeracy to achieve English and maths GCSE by 19. Do invest in long-term, high-quality, high-dosage tutoring. Protect the wording participation budget. It really does work. Invest in those employment programs. Do focus on level one and two apprenticeships. Do implement the youth opportunity guarantee and always put the heart and the needs of the people we want to upskill at the heart of any programme design. And that's getting young people in the room, in the table to contribute to what works. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eleanor. That was um, uh, very wide-ranging and, um, uh, and, and, and inspiring stuff. So we've had plenty of plugging for level three, but also for level two um, over on my right. So um, moving swiftly on now, we're going to come to um, Chris Oglesby, uh, a, a great friend and relation and ally of the Centre for Social Justice. Um, and uh, um, we'll be very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, thanks very much, Gavin uh, and uh, Alex and uh, and Eleanor. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm uh, chief exec of a commercial property company called Bruntwood, based here in Manchester, that is focused on creating thriving towns and cities. Um, I also sit on a numerous place and industry boards, including the local enterprise partnership in Greater Manchester and the Northern Powerhouse Partnership uh, Board. And uh, for for, for the last uh, 20 years or so, I've been working on the devolution agenda here in Greater Manchester, and I'm a bit of a stuck record on that, but also very realistic, I think, as to, uh, as to what's likely to be achievable, uh, and the word now is partnership, I suppose, more than revolution. I'll come, we'll come back to that. So our business is the largest developer and manager of innovation districts and a flexible workspace across towns and cities of the north, and we've got 6,000 businesses in our properties, and we work with our city partners to develop their economic strategies and then align our strategy with theirs. So um, as, uh, as has been mentioned already, um, we also have a family charitable trust that owns 25% of our business, which works alongside the business. So we've got that very grassroots exposure as well. But for today, um, I'll be very much looking at things from a business perspective, as I think we've got uh, a, good, a very good panel here that will uh, that will pick up the other the other perspective. And our business recognises that our success is down to the success of our towns and cities. So my number one priority over the last 30 years in the north, uh, post our sort of deindustrialized, uh, sort of de the, the industrialization of the 80s, has been job creation. Single focus. We've got to create jobs. But for the last five years or so, the challenge hasn't actually been generating the jobs. We're generating more jobs than we can fill now. The challenge has been developing the skilled people to fill those jobs. I was always a strong Remainer through the Brexit debate, but did see the by potential positive byproduct of, break, being, of Brexit being the lack of cheap imported labour would actually force companies to invest in productivity to create better quality jobs and also to force them to engage in developing more domestic talent rather than uh, taking the easy option and importing it. And we're seeing, we're seeing that happen now. And COVID's only accelerated this Brexit impact such, uh, as has been mentioned already, that we've got record job vacancies. And our customers in the buildings uh, tell us the biggest single thing uh, challenge their business is the lack of skilled talent. So I won't frame on uh, framing the don't dwell on framing the challenge, but rather look at as I say look at this from the business perspective and lots of reasons to be optimistic. Uh, firstly, that shortage of talent means that that it's now a shared agenda for business. They have got to be engaged. Secondly, for most quality businesses, diversity is no longer just a box tick. It's been proven to drive better business results. So businesses actually want people from all backgrounds. They want to get engaged in this agenda. For those that haven't yet woken up to this, the focus on ESG means that they will need to because they're going to get measured on it. And, uh, and the financial and professional service jobs of the 90s and 2000s tended to be elitist. They tended to be um, difficult to, uh, to access, whereas more latterly, these tech-driven jobs rely less on background and more on talent, so they can be filled by people from all backgrounds. And playing to the diversity point earlier, we're seeing organisations deliberately targeting uh, kids from, uh, from poorer backgrounds. And then finally, the accessible jobs that were created in the 90s and 2000s, they weren't attractive to kids. So they didn't aspire to want to, who would want to work in a call centre? Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's just not aspirational, fulfilling work. The jobs that we're creating today are aspirational and fulfilling. So business wants to be engaged, it needs to be engaged, and the jobs that they're creating are accessible. So reason to be optimistic. And you know, looking at it from a government point of view, they need to be engaged, 
the majority depends upon uh, upon upon actually addressing these issues through uh, through levelling up. I genuinely believe people in government want to uh, tackle this problem as well, uh, because ultimately the success of the country uh, depends upon us unlocking the talent of the, the the whole population. So we have this sort of this perfect storm of uh, of need and want. And so very quickly in terms of uh, solutions, well, I would say this, wouldn't I? We need a devolved solution. We need a devolved solution because people are place-based. We need a devolved solution because every place's economy is different and it needs a difference. Also, demand is increasingly granular as our economy is dominated by SMEs, so we need local aggregators of demand. This is, there are very few Jaguar Land Rovers out there that can go and set up their own universities or talent pools. We need place-based aggregators of, of skills demand. We also need on-the-ground quality assurance of providers as well because provision, the quality of provision is, uh, is mixed, to say the least. And finally, skills is only part of the solution. It needs to be fully integrated into the wider place strategy, which really then links to my second thing that we need to do, which is we need a partnership approach. We need a partnership between central government and local government. We need a partnership then at a local level between business, local government, schools, HE and FE, private sector training organisations and the third sector. A few examples of this. We're pitching hard in Greater Manchester at the moment for a place-based innovation deal to develop the innovation ecosystem that has skills at the heart, which allows business, um, those SMEs that are really driving um, either diffusing or, uh, or adopting innovation, uh, aggregating their demand from skills and developing uh, pathways with uh, other local stakeholders. And, uh, and then finally, just, uh, just a comment, we need the same join up at government as well. Increasingly what we see is we, uh, we, we see this rather siloed approach in government where different, um, it, where different ministries don't necessarily speak across the piece. And uh, we take a great deal of heart in terms of the way the government is tooling up its, uh, its, um, its levelling up. Uh, department as has been called now uh, and it's important that, that, that colleagues then work across the uh, system on that and Neil O'Brien's tweet yesterday which had the four things that he saw as being at the root of, uh, of levelling up the one thing I would add to that in terms of point one which talked about empowering local leaders and communities I would say is, is the one thing that you can empower those local leaders and communities but we need to develop local leadership not everywhere has the quality of local leadership that we've got uh, in this CD, city region and you need to develop that culture of collaboration both nationally locally but also at a place level because again working around the country as we do not everywhere has that culture of collaboration but lots of reasons to be optimistic this is a shared problem that everybody wants and needs to address now we just need to will the means as well as the end Chris, thank you very much. It's fascinating to hear that uh, what you're witnessing uh, on the ground is that there are these jobs available, but it's just that the, uh, there's a certain deficit of, uh, of skills there, of, of, uh, of getting people trained up for those vacancies that are available. Um, I'm very conscious that uh, we need to make time for discussion, so swiftly I'll move on to Joe Watford from uh, Football Beyond Borders. Um, well, well, hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, th thanks for inviting me along. and. Uh, Really good to be speaking with such, uh, yeah, esteemed, esteemed, uh, such an esteemed panel. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of focus on um, a bit of what Eleanor, Eleanor said, and and the minister said around, um, yeah, what we do at Football Beyond Borders to ensure that young people, when they get to sort of 16, that they're able to sort of uh, transition successfully into adulthood. Um, I've been at FBB, as we like to call it, for sort of seven years now, um, and I've had the privilege of working with schools um, and an organisation that. Um, support young people that are deemed at risk of exclusion, that are deemed vulnerable and sort of have all these sort of risk factors that we know impact you at later life um, to support them to finish with the skills um, and grades necessary for a su successful transition into adulthood. Uh, I've been lucky enough to have different roles. So I've worked in the design and delivery of our programs. I've worked in an income generating capacity and most recently um, as our head of policy. And I think this sort of triple perspective gives me a unusual but also useful sort of insight as to how we can support teachers to support young people that are struggling um, and where the changes may come in reducing school exclusions and uh, through early intervention i'm gonna sp i've got five minutes everyone that knows me knows i'm very bad with time but um i'm gonna try and focus on three areas prioritization funding and skills so firstly i think the pandemic um feels like we're still in a pandemic, but we're not. Some people wearing masks, some people not. But it was the first time in my uh, lifetime where 
I witness sort of the society coming together to question, you know, what's the purpose of education? How can we make sure that this advantage does not sort of negatively impact young people um, just by, by the luck or, you know, by chance of being born to a family in a community in a region where, you know, you're impacted negatively. And I think we heard so many debates and rightfully so around how can we catch up academically, but there was very little um, about how we can ensure that young people have access and can maintain trusted relationship with skilled adults at school. Um, I've visited, I've been lucky enough to visit a number of schools across the country. We work in London, the wider Southeast and the Northwest, and we're looking to expand even further. Um, and what's been noticeable has been the reduction in the number of people um, that sort of provide these key relationships for young people in schools, um, tied to school budgets, opportunity costs of, you know, maths teacher, TA, um, and what's happened has meant that um, student well-being has, has been added to sort of the workload of teachers. And, you know, teachers, I think, are some of the most underappreciated, uh, you know, professionals in our country, but having to sort of teach maths, achieve academic outcomes, while also, you know, picking up the, the trauma and the sort of impact of a child who's maybe struggling at home or has different struggles that aren't sort of visible to the eye is something that's very difficult. At Football Beyond Borders, we know that um, stable relationships with trusted adults are the best protective factor for remaining for a young person remaining in education, especially those from difficult homes. But unfortunately, it doesn't take sort of the forefront of, of discussions around the purpose of education and how we can ensure to support um, these young people. I'll give you an example. Um, a young person that I met on a visit in the Northwest, sort of towards the back end of last year, um, I went and I asked him, what, what does he think um, students need in a post-pandemic world in order to thrive and develop and to catch up? Um, and he literally said, you know, one of the most powerful statements that's sort of ever been said to me by a young person, he said, when you feel good, you can be good and you can do good in school. Um, we need someone to talk to to help us through the difficulties, especially after the pandemic. I had no one during the lockdowns and most of my teachers now don't have time to help me because they need to help the other students. Um, the young man spoke about being rejected, overwhelmed and angry by his lack of support. Um, and it was he identified that he needed this support. Um, and I asked the question, how different would the prospects of vulnerable students be if we sort of entered uh, discussions around catch up around how we can make how can we make it a priority of the system whereby every vulnerable young person has a trusted adult by their side throughout their adolescence. I'll move on to funding. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, FBB exists to stop young people being excluded. But what's happened over it, well, fortunately, we exist, but unfortunately, exclusions are a rising phenomena. And what's happened over the last few years is um, there's been a, a massive rise in AP, 27% um, increase in the number of students registered in AP between 2012 and 2018, whereas only a 7% rise in the pupil population. What this tells me is um, there's a sort of incentives against early intervention and against keeping certain young people who we believe at FBB can thrive in a mainstream setting. Um, and, you know, students are being sort of moved on into AP. And what we know about AP is it is it costs five times as much to educate a young person in AP while delivering 10 times as worse outcomes. And I don't know, I, I, I studied economics at uni, I don't think I'm the most business minded, but that doesn't really sort of match up for me. Um, and um, yeah, and I know there is a lot of funding out there in terms of supporting vulnerable students. You have a high needs block, we have EHCP or educational healthcare plans, and we have pupil premium funding. Um, but these don't really work at an early intervention stage. They usually come much later. Um, and it leaves, and even within that, um, it leaves sort of, we, we were doing a bit of research, I think with the CSJ around sort of 210,000 young people whose home lives are really chaotic. Um, they, you know, really try, they're involved with social services and, um, you know, for stuff like abuse, neglect, um, you know, really sort of domestic violence, chaotic home lives. Um, but there's still no, there is an additional funding for these 210,000 students. And even before COVID, young people um, involved with the social services were most likely to underperform at school. Um, an education data lab um, re piece of research came out last year that said young people that were excluded at school at any point in their life were, sort of, I think, 16 or 17 times more likely to end up in custody. Um, and we've known this even before COVID, and I think COVID has really amplified the impact of these things. Um, so a colleague, for example, I was speaking to the other day, spoke about a young person whose life was significantly impacted by COVID. He lost four family members as a result of the pandemic and his grandfather sort of uh, uh, had a stroke. And um, at that point, we, you know, he, we, we were there to support, but there was no sort of obvious way within the system that schools and school leaders and teachers could really provide that young person with immediate, urgent 
support um, that he's likely, you know, his need to re-engage in school and to thrive in school and ask the question, and something at FBB we spend a lot of the time thinking about is how can we create a system which uh, provides the, the right kind of rapid mental health support that this young boy is going to need to thrive at school. And then finally, something that's really close to my heart, um, having worked in delivery, and um, is there's a combination of a lack of sort of really specific funding for vulnerable students that don't fall in to the high needs threshold and EHCP plans, um, and then a deprioritization of sort of reports, which has sort of created a weird dynamic around re the reduction of school exclusions. Um, we have this really rise in the number of TAs, for example, who are you know, agency staff, unskilled, low paid um, staff, um, you know, they have the lived experience that is necessary to really support these young people and really come from the communities and really have the drive to support them. Um, and while I really value the kind of, um, you know, the emphasis on getting relatable role models in school and supporting young people in school, um, we, 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 we want to get to a point where these, these staff are sort of equipped and skilled to be able to support these young people um, who, are, who come from really chaotic backgrounds, who have really difficult home lives, to really support them to thrive in school. Um, and that's essentially our project at FBB. Um, we've been lucky enough to yeah, work with young people and achieve 98% um, sort of keeping them in school where you know, the exclusion rates are far higher. And our, 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 we, we're looking to reverse the pattern by matching sort of relevant lived experience with advanced level, uh, level qualifications and adolescent counseling, teaching and youth work. Um, and so yeah, asking the, the question that we're kind of driving at the moment through our therapeutic wellbeing approach, working in, in partnerships with schools is how can we create a system where the most talented and qualified staff members are working with our most at-risk young people in school. Thank you very much. Joe, thank you so much. And it's great to hear about the uh, excellent work of your fantastic organization. Um, so uh, final um, uh, initial <laughs> short speech then will be from Alice, and then we'll move into some discussion and some Q&A. So over to Alice. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, as I've mentioned, I work for Voice 21, which is the National Oracy Education Charity. And I'll talk a little bit about that word Oracy in a moment, because you might be like, I've never heard that word. What is she talking about? Um, but essentially, we work with schools up and down the country to transform, transform learning and life chances through talk. So we work with whole schools um, to develop teachers and to develop school leaders to deliver a high quality oracy education. So that's giving the time and space and dedicated teaching to speaking and listening skills. Um, I guess slightly different to others in the panel in that I'm focusing more on school aged children. That's, that's where Voice 21 works. We work with hundreds of schools across the country um, from, from kind of primary schools with early years provision all the way through to secondary schools with sixth forms. But I guess my kind of um, like ask of the rest of the panel really is to, is to just think about how this relates so crucially to, to other agendas that have been discussed and raised. So for instance, post-16 education is not an island. What happens for those young people between the ages of 16 and 19 is built upon the, like, built upon the foundations of what they've experienced through school. And similarly, employment is directly fed by the skills and talents that young people bring from their education um, in schooling. So what I want to, to do today is, is give you a feel for why oracy education, why you should consider speaking and listening a basic skill, if you want to use that language, equally a foundational skill, a fundamental skill. So if I just go back to that word oracy, some people go, why do you use that word? It's an ugly word. <laughs> it's a fair point. We use it, though, deliberately, so it, it would be fair for you to have not come across it as a word. It's a made-up word. It was coined in the 1960s by an academic called Andrew Wilkinson. Um, and he coined it um, for two reasons. Uh, one, to kind of suggest the connection between um, spoken language skills and having a kind of equivalence with literacy and numeracy. So just like being literate and numerate, speaking skills are essential and they unlock other areas of learning and the curriculum. But also crucially that they're teachable skills. They're not a set of skills that some people just have by chance or by luck of birth and others don't. They can and should be taught in schools and to not do so disadvantages certain children. And so at Voice 21, the schools that we work with recognize that, they can see that in, their, in the children that they teach. Um, that often there's, there's a gap in terms of the spoken language skills that students arrive at school with. And we work with teachers and school leaders to deliberately and systematically teach oracy skills. And primarily our work draws upon a framework for that which was developed with academics at Cambridge University through an education endowment fund pilot, in fact. Um, and it, it focuses on four 
strands, as we call them, so the physical aspects of, of speaking and listening, so your gestures, your body language, your facial expressions, your voice, the linguistic aspects, so your grammar, your vocabulary, your register, the cognitive aspects of talk, so the, the content of what you're saying, the thinking that goes into what you're saying, um, your ability to summarise and ask questions, um, and then the social and emotional elements of talk, so how you relate to other people, how you listen, how you take turns. And so through developing those skills, we're enabling children both to learn how to talk, so to become more confident speakers and listeners, but also to learn through talk. And I guess that, that's where this relates really kind of crucially to, to Alex's agenda in terms of you know, looking at children or students, young people, leaving school without basic skills like literacy. How does talk actually unlock that and enable the teaching of those skills? And crucially, what, why is this a, a kind of social justice is issue? You know, Voice 21, we're a charity with a mission. We focus our work on those who need it most. Um, and and we, we exist because we recognise there is a huge inequality currently in our education system. So when children arrive at school, age five, there's already a 19-month gap in terms of language between the most advantaged students and their disadvantaged peers. And you would hope that as a child moves through school, that gap would close and in fact it widens currently. So that's why we focus our work on schools, because schools are the second chance for lots of children who arrive already disadvantaged in terms of their language skills. So there's that gap that exists, and then there's also a gap in terms of the state sector and the independent sector. So it probably won't come as a surprise to you that when we've polled teachers, those in the independent sector report that they value talk, they spend time teaching it, parents expect their children to leave school, confident and articulate and eloquent and so of course they spend time and attention on it and in the state sector that's not the case because it's not valued in the state system there's not space for it there's not time for it and then there's a kind of third le level I guess in terms of like why this is a social justice issue right now which is of course the pandemic like the huge elephant in the room um, we, we polled teachers um, last summer and 66% of primary school teachers reported that they'd seen their children, spoke, like the children they teach, spoken language skills um, re regress or decline during the pandemic for children from free school meal households. And 44% of secondary teachers said the same thing. So by having children obviously outside of school, outside of those language rich environments, that they're missing out on that kind of rich language experience. So the challenge that we've kind of put to the education system, and, and I'd like to put to Alex as well, is how do we kind of get away from this current system where essentially the teaching of speaking and listening is left to chance. We kind of just assume that because everyone just does it, you kind of get to age five and hopefully you've mastered the basics and then we just leave it to just happen, um, hopefully by os osmosis, I guess. Um, that, that means that we're underlooking and undervaluing a crucial skill that unlocks so much and that so much else is resting upon. Um, if you think about how much time and attention we spend on teaching literacy, for instance, and the teaching of reading and how we start with phonics, and you know, once a child masters basic literacy, we don't just go, ah, oh, cool, well, get on with it then. You know, we stretch them, we push them, we think about a curriculum that, that deliberately and systematically takes them through great texts and more challenging um, types of reading. And so similarly, we need to do the same for spoken language, for oracy skills. We need to think about how they can be deliberately and systematically taught within the education system. And in terms of like the difference that that can make, so as I mentioned, we work with hundreds of schools, so we've seen that difference firsthand, but there's also swathes of academic research about the, the impact and the value of oracy. So I've mentioned earlier literacy, seems like an obvious place to start. Um, as a, there's an academic called James Britton that uh, lots of teachers, I'm, I am a former teacher, lots of teachers always come back to him, he's kind of seminal, and he wrote, reading and writing float on a sea of talk. And when you have it put like that, it's so true, it's so fundamental and foundational. Teachers often say, if you can't say it, you can't read it, if you can't read it, you can't write it. The relationship is vital, and yet in the national curriculum, as stands, reading and writing are kind of elevated and given a huge amount of status, and spoken language kind of bumps along the bottom with the odd mention here and there. Um, so there's a huge relationship in terms of literacy, there's a huge impact in terms of your access to the rest of the curriculum, and in terms of attainment, there's lots of academic research that shows that, and that attainment doesn't, you know, that Im increase for attainment doesn't just happen for like, English language, for instance, but also maths and science. This is about a, a kind of approach to teaching that exists in every, uh, every subject across the curriculum. 
there's the effect on well-being and confidence you know that idea that like it's good to talk you relate to people you build relationships to the to the things that joseph was mentioning earlier through talk is how we how we do lots of those things and how we manage our emotions and relate to other people um but also then beyond school to kind of speak to some of what chris was talking about the the spoken language skills are essential in terms of employability and if you look at surveys of employers year in year out the thing that they say school leavers lack is spoken language skills or communication skills or listening skills or you know teamwork skills however you want to call them they crop up there again and again as something that schools school leavers don't have on leaving school and similarly if you look at the kind of future of work agenda like to put it bluntly, like when everyone is replaced with a robot, what will be left is the things that make us human. And that's the ability to be creative, to problem solve with other people, to talk to people, to relate to them, to empathise. Those are the places where the kind of jobs that I assume this government wants to create lie. And oracy skills underp underpin those things. So there's also like a fundamental question there around like social mobility and social justice, which is are we equipping young people with the with the skills that they need to be able to move on in life and to get those jobs. So in terms of kind of what's needed then to make this a reality, I'm aware I've not followed the time, so tell me, Gavin, if I'm... <laughs> just, just, just I'll wrap a, up a minute. minute. More, okay. That's all right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so in terms of what's required to make this a reality, kind of what, what are our asks? I guess um, the, the big thing is around signalling and uh, supporting schools to make this shift. And the DfE has huge sway, obviously, in that, in terms of signalling the value of oracy, um, under, like its place in the national curriculum, its place within assessments, for instance, enabling teachers to teach it, so ha investing in teacher development um, that enables teachers to understand what makes a high-quality oracy education. So we've developed a set of benchmarks that set out that standard that are driven by the research around you know, the types of classroom talk that, that have the most impact on young people. Obviously, like... Not all classroom talk is equal. Some some is better than others. Um, so you know what are the what are the really effective ways that teachers can use talk? It's not just kind of setting up idle chit chat in your classroom. It's thinking really purposefully and deliberately about the talk that you want to happen. Um, and so I guess with that, an, an ask for. Um, for Alex and others in, in the Department for Education to follow the evidence on this one because there's a huge amount of evidence and currently it's like this untapped resource like talk is free and it's everywhere and we do it all of the time and yet it's not given very much time and attention at all so to that point that I started with you know the, the education system is not a series of islands they're interconnected and so the things that we start with in early years foundation where talk does have some status that should run all the way through secondary school to relate to things like post-16 education apprenticeships um, and kind of moving on transition to careers and yeah I'll leave it there <laughs> Alice, thank you so much. It's actually it's fascinating. I suppose when one thinks about it um, in this communication-rich age, so much of what we do on a daily basis in our professional lives involves oral presentational skills. Yeah, is that something that is formally taught in, in all schools mm -hmm. in as thorough a way as it, as it, as it, as it should be? Uh, something I've not fully considered before. Um, so we're, we're running a little bit short of time. I do want to make time for questions, but if I could just pick up on one thread that uh, I thought sort of arose in the discussion around uh, level two and, and level three. It seems to me as though this question around universities and the kind of tertiary um, space, um, on the one hand, um, obviously, um, as Eleanor said, um, absolutely validly, uh, it's very important that we facilitate the choices um, of, of young people um, and uh, give them that opportunity to go and pursue what it is that they want to do, and that's absolutely vital. Um, but then <coughs> also, on the other hand, I think there, is a, there may be a valid question to be asked about the extent to which um, universities have been providing the skills um, for the jobs that are actually available in the economy for some people and perhaps the skills that the country actually requires. So how do we strike that balance between facilitating people's choices and actually generating the kind of skills that might lead to employment or lead to the kind of skills that the economy needs? Can we maybe start with Alex and then see if anyone else has any, any thoughts on that? Sure. I, well, look, to, to go back to um, Eleanor's very, um, you know, very valid point about HE and FE, and you know how these two depend on each other. And I, I'm not sort of wild about the distinctions that we tend to draw between, um, you know, vocational courses and academic courses, and you know, further education and higher education. You know, we, we have a lot of great 
really great uh, training courses that are now delivered by universities. You know, I'm sure we all know people who studied medicine at university who were doing a vocational course, but you know, we're doing it in an HE setting. You know, that these the way in which we talk about things is um, is often also uh, accidentally cementing this idea that. Um, that the vocational route or the non-university route is in some way uh, less valid or has less opportunity, and that's that's absolutely not the case. Now, on on the on the point of uh, partnership, and Chris, you, you spoke about as well, Chris, and, um, as Eleanor, um, it, it's essential. And as I try to touch on in in my remarks, you know, one of the things that our reform agenda is uh, is really trying to do is to bring together the voices of local business and local industry so that uh, the provision of services and, and the advice given to potential students, to their parents um, uh, and, uh, and the rest of it I is done in such a way that we know that the courses that we're putting on are providing routes into employment for, um, you know, for people who are taking them up. Uh, that's such a fundamental part of the picture, having that responsive system. And, um, and so, yeah, that, that does require better working, better working between uh, DFE and localities, better work between localities and businesses, better work between everybody and uh, employers. And, but, you know, we're getting there. We are on that path to reform. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Maybe I'd just uh, quickly come in. Um, it's a good challenge from Gavin, you know, the balance between choice and skills. But then I think... Sometimes what we want for ourselves is different from what we want for other people. And I have a two-year-old, I'm like, would I want to deny him the choice to kind of truly have the best possible education that he wanted on his own terms? And I think when it comes to our own children, we're like, no, no, they've got to have choice. And so I'd say a couple of things. Like, I think it is about informed choices. So young people, particularly young people from poorer backgrounds, really knowing the level of opportunity and the types of roles out there and that exposure, we know that really good work in work placements can really work but I'd also say kind of people who set up universities they weren't me measuring their primary outcome on like employment kind of you know they are much wider than jobs it's about learning and knowledge it's about history aspiration and kind of thinking to the future so I do think it's really lying in what Chris touched into about universities and business partnerships in local areas and some of the wraparound and other activities that happen at university I think there's an option there but I think none of us would be in favour of saying to our own children, no, you can't do that. I think it just doesn't sit well. Yeah, I think actually in some of the research that the CSJ did around STEM, one of the things that we discovered was actually one of the big off-putting factors for young people from a sort of non-STEM traditional background, if you like, was that um, uh, was sort of thinking it wasn't for them or a lack of knowledge of the STEM field. So, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, any other points on that before we move just, to some questions? Say just one other yeah. thing as well to say that I, I think, um, and business will fund it, because at the moment there's a huge cost to business in terms of colleague turnover and recruitment, and so for every so for every £50,000 uh, digital uh, person that you've got to recruit, you're paying a £10,000 uh, recruitment fee, and you're seeing companies now putting that £10,000 into effectively a grant for, for, a young, for, a, for a person to go through one of these coding boot camps. You just replicate that right throughout, uh, right throughout the economy. So if we can create those pathways and make it really clear to business how they do that, and again, I would say this, wouldn't I? But I see that best of, best done at a, on a local basis between those relationships between universities and uh, and business, where we're seeing so much more stickability in graduates who are typically now instead of following those golden paved roads down to London, are actually staying in their locality and uh, and choosing to uh, to live where they uh, where they've studied as well. So you can create that pathway between local jobs. And, uh, and, and between their students as well. That's fascinating. It. Um, I think we'll go to some um, Q&A from the floor now. Also, if you are watching online, you can ask a question virtually through Slido, which I didn't know existed, but as um, but I, I've had to scrub up on today. Um, so do send those through. Um, I think we'll start here, shall we? Yes. Uh, um, There's a uh, microphone coming. Oh, I don't use a new microphone, but we'll, we'll, we'll be all right. Well, whatever you prefer. For, for the online audience. Um, I'm curious to know how important the devolution agenda is to meaningful uh, skills gap, what's the right word, narrowing in, in, in the UK. No one likes to take that. So is your question, do you mean sort of geographical devolution to the nations, I mean, or I do you mean more regional devolution? Well, I, I think, yeah, 
I mean, essentially, I, I speak as someone who set up a, an urban recovery network during COVID called Cities Restart that, that's apolitical. And we've done an event with Metro mayors of all political persuasions. Mm -hmm. And they all speak specifically to devolution and interestingly to its impact on their ability to fix structural youth unemployment in their immediate regions. So I was trying to be concise in my question before, <laughs> but I get fed up with people self-promoting before they get to the question. <laughs> but, but that was the context. When we talked to Andy Burnham, when we, you know, when we talked to Steve Rotherham, uh, w when we talk to Ben, you know, they say we need more devolution in our local neighborhoods so we can fix our own skills crisis, our own employment issues. Is that, does that square? Is that consistent with what you believe? Uh, you're, you're looking at me, sir, so I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll um, ask the question. I, the, uh, I can direct you to my colleague Neil O'Brien's tweet from yesterday. Neil O'Brien is new, a new minister for leveling up in the Department of Leveling Up and Housing and Communities and some other things as well. And, um, uh, when he, uh, he, in, but the number one point in his four-point uh, outline of what leveling up meant was empowering local leaders. And so there is clearly um, an appetite from the central department in government uh, looking at leveling up to have those conversations with local leaders. And if I may ask a follow-up minister, if you don't mind. Could you just make it very, very quick yeah. because we're in a few minutes Do you find left. that appetite equally maps across Treasury and their appetite for fiscal devolution to those same metro regions? Oh, well, now you're, you're tempting me into an, I, it would be a brave man who would upset the Treasury on the eve of a spending review. <laughs> um, tre treasury is a wonderful organization. <laughs> it does brilliant work for the good of, uh, good of society. Let's let the minister off on that one, I think. <laughs> um, uh, should we take a couple at the time? So perhaps you, sir, and then um, the gentleman in the back, maybe. Um, thank you. I was very interested in Alice's point that um, school is a second chance for some children, and also in the idea that children need, um, uh, we need to invest in levels one and two. Now, I want to suggest that there is a serious skills gap, and has been since 1980, um, in the teaching of reading and maths to children for whom learning these things is not straightforward. Um, there's been a big emphasis on inclusion and often at the expense of the teaching of literacy skills. And J um, Janet Hewitt, um, Jackie Hewitt Mains just joined the Conservative Party. People may have seen her excellent uh, television program with Sandy Toxvig. Um, and I did recommend on Con Home that Alex might like to meet her. I hope he will, but I hope he will promote training for teachers to teach these skills effectively. Right, thank you. And then um, I think that it was the, uh, or you, yes, just with my thank yeah. you. I'm yeah. Abdul Matin from the Isle of Wight Conservative Association. Um, the children who do their A levels when they're about 10 are special to their parents, and the children who are still struggling when they're 16 uh, with the mental age of about nine are special to their parents. As a panel, how are you going to work together uh, to make sure the children who are special to their parents with a ment lower mental age uh, going to be able to catch up uh, so that uh, they can be a contributor to the wider economy? Thank you. So the first question was about um, uh, achieving basic literacy and skills and whether perhaps the drive towards inclusion was in tension with that in some way, and the second was to do with uh, dealing with um, children who are, um, who are who are disadvantaged. Okay. Any thoughts? I mean, I can take the one on kind of special needs and just to say, like, children with learning needs were particularly devastatingly hit in COVID, particularly kind of, you know, well-intentioned emergency COVID legislation took away that statutory duty. There was a lot of compromise that went on and lack of care. Um, you know, it won't surprise anybody that young people with learning difficulties are also overrepresented in children being excluded from schools. One of the challenges in that field is um, there is lots of data and evidence, but kind of outcomes driven programs, there's not enough of that quality yet and that benchmark putting kind of pushing stuff. So being able to invest in what truly works. It's more in its infancy than it should be. Um, and we really got to drive that. And that's partly that problem is because, you know, it's highly relational work and it's often very small sets of numbers. And that makes it very different, difficult for academics and others to do the evaluation. But it does need to be a priority. And uh, people fear it because it's also really expensive. 
Thank you. I think we are quite pushed for time, so I'm just going to take one more, I think, and then um, the minister will have to go, unfortunately. Um, I think the gentleman at the back, who I tried to point to before. <laughs> Thanks very much, and a really interesting conversation. Just a quick question in terms of skills as a holistic approach. Yeah, I, I used to be a primary school teacher. My school was 97% free school meals. Uh, the parents didn't necessarily have that aspiration. Based towards skills based teaching as, as, as an idea in terms of helping to push through. So, you can talk about level twos and level threes later on, but if you're going in and you just know who Henry VIII's wives were rather than having the analytical skills to understand about the skills involved, about why that might be important, you, you're not necessarily going to push forward when you get to higher education or further education. So, are we undervaluing skills based educational methods? Anyone? I mean, it's a massive challenge. I feel like Alice should maybe take this. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. it, is, um, it is that constant tension. And perhaps, you know, just to be brief, one of our challenges is we can see lots of gaps in our education system, but what's happening is people just keep adding at the moment, and that creates a bit of curriculum overload, which means it's all kind of under pressure. But we know that we have to have that focus on skills and knowledge, but they're parts of the same coin and the parts of that same ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Alice, did you have anything to add? Yes, I'll add. Um, I mean, so obviously I've talked about oracy and I've talked about that as being a, an essential skill. That said, I wouldn't say, and that exists completely in separation from knowledge and that they're in two kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. I think um, it's, it's a kind of false dichotomy to, to jump from one to the other. And certainly what we've seen, like, you know, the richest conversations, for instance, where students can apply oracy skills or writing skills or analytical skills will be where they have that foundation in knowledge. And equally, the use of those skills helps them to develop knowledge, make meaning, grapple with understanding, recall things. So they, they feed each other. Um, so I guess, yes, we have had a kind of certainly an exam system that's put a lot of emphasis currently on the recall and kind of regurgitation of information. I guess, though, still, I would like to argue, and as I guess a former teacher, like teachers still have a lot of control to think about how students arrive at that knowledge and understanding and developing skills as they do so, and how do we get the most out of that? Thanks very much, Alice. Um, I'm afraid we are on quite a tight schedule, so I will have to draw a Q&A to a close. But it's a fascinating and wide-ranging discussion there. I think lots of threads to pick up on and things to think about. Um, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Alice, Chris, Alex, Eleanor and Joe, our uh, excellent and esteemed um, panel who's given, uh, given us so many thought-provoking um, uh, comments and insights today. Um, our next event is... Um